Definitely some personal bias here, but the Death Guard are by far my favorite Traitor Legion. They take two of my most favorite things, the undead and badass power armor, and smoosh them together into a whole bunch of nasty abominations. But they're more than a whole bunch of nasty boys, as their philosophies on one hand are actually really interesting, but on the other are downright chilling. Like, did you know that the Death Guard don't actually hate their greatest enemies, the Imperium of Mankind? They actually just think of them as deeply ignorant and misguided. And their ultimate goal is to show mankind how great the gross life can be when you give up showering. But how did the Death Guard go from being some of humanity's greatest heroes to Nurgle's special nasty boys? Who was Mortarion? And how did he go from being a country bumpkin sad boy who killed alien necromancers for fun to a giant 30 foot tall plague induced abomination? What about Typhus and the Destroyer Plague? What role did they have in the Legion's downfall? And what is that plague planet that the Death Guard now call home? Is it just a big stinky green rock in the Eye of Terror? Or is there something far more sinister under its mile high layer of poisonous clouds? And most importantly of all, was Mortarion actually bald or did he have some sweet heavy metal hair under that cowl? We're going to get into all of that and a lot more because there's a lot to cover with the 14th Legion. But before that, I'm gonna give a quick shout out to this week's sponsor and then we're gonna get into the galaxy's smelliest Legion. Stay tuned. This video is sponsored by X Sheets. After a long day of gaming, you need rest. And now you can get it with X Sheets, the only LED powered bed sheets made for gamers. Enjoy maximum nighttime visibility and supercharge your circadian rhythm. 13 million lumens of soothing night glow. Okay, wait a minute, no, 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 hold up. That is gonna be the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But you know what's not dumb? Raid Shadow Legends. Are you tired of fluffy and cartoonish looking games? Raid Shadow Legends will take you to a world of dark fantasy and realism. And there's a ton happening in Raid this month. With some new champions, an update to Tag Arena, and a full schedule of special events and tournaments. But here's the main event. Raid's currently running a special Deliana Chase event, where you can get your hands on the amazing Deliana, a brand new legendary champion from the High Elves faction just by logging in. All you have to do is log in and play Raid for seven days between now and July 20th, and you'll get Deliana for free. And Deliana is one of the strongest support champions in the entire game and can help carry your team through many of Raid's tougher challenges. You definitely don't wanna miss out on her. This is the best time to get started in Raid. And if you click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get a free starter pack worth almost $40. We're talking three free champions at once. Misery Cord, Tiger Soul, and Romero. Plus 10 Magic XP Brews, 10 Force XP Brews, and 10 Spirit Brews. And that's pretty huge. They only gave away one champion in the past. So don't miss out on your last chance to get such big rewards. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. And it's that easy. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in game. And the gifts keep on coming. All new players listen up. Once you're in the game, just enter the promo code MYDELIANA to get your hands on everything. Get 50 XP brews to instantly get your legendary hero Deliana to max level, as well as a ton of extra silver. Thanks again to the awesome people over at Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and let's get into it. The universe of the 41st millennium is filled with some truly horrifying entities, from various and voracious alien species that seek to purge the universe of mankind, to literal space demons. There are perhaps none more rotten and terrifying than the members of the Death Guard themselves a legion of disease-riddled space marines that, after betraying the Imperium, turned to the worship of the Grandfather, Nurgle, the chaos god of disease and filth. The Death Guard have become the Plague Lord's most favored children, as none are more effective in spreading his bubonic gifts across the stars. And the Grandfather is incredibly generous and shows his love for his children by blessing them with new poxes, diseases, and mutations, each a symbol of his paternal love and affection for his cursed children. Of all the lost souls who have ever worshipped the Plague God, none have been so blessed as the Death Guard. Every one of their soldiers has become a living avatar of pestilence, a repository of vile parasites and demon-born diseases, a menagerie of sickening and grotesque corruption. They are a mockery of life and a blasphemous reminder of just how far the Emperor's creations can fall. Their bodies are in a constant state of rot and decay. In many cases, they have become so swelled with Nurgle's gifts that they are literally beginning to tear apart at the seams. Bloated and rancid organs spilling forth from them in a pestilent tide, their insides dragging behind them through the mud and muck of a thousand battlefields. Swollen with maggots and parasites, their stench alone is enough to cause a human in their vicinity to convulse and spasm and be unable to fight back, making them easy prey as the Legion descends upon them. 
Their forms are truly horrifying to look at, but the gifts of the Plague Lord render them completely immune to pain and most injuries. They are trapped in a moment between life and death, frozen in time before their demise, cursed to live forever and endure constant demonic mutation and entropy. And long before they became what they are today, the Death Guard were a legion of space marines that excelled in attrition-style warfare. They utilized tactics that favored massive waves of foot-slogging infantry that would grind their opponent into dust. They had no need for speed or an over-reliance on massive war machines like other legions. The Death Guard were by far the toughest and most resilient of all Astartes legions. These guys were virtually immune to any form of disease or poison, and they made sure of this by subjecting themselves to the most vile concoctions and diseases in the galaxy. The Death Guard even had a ritual where they would ritualistically drink poison to celebrate certain achievements, much like a normal person might pop a bottle of champagne. Now thousands of years later and in their corrupted state, they still utilize the same philosophies of war that they did back in the days of the Grand Crusade. Their intense training, combined with the grotesque blessings of the Plague Lord, have created a legion of unkillable monsters. Any rounds that manage to penetrate their rotting and rusting armor are absorbed and dissolved in the disgusting chemical concoction of their insides. Melee weapons that manage to break through their defenses get caught in folds of rancid flesh, unable to be pried free by their assailants. Disarmed and vulnerable, they are easy prey for the Death Guard's disease-riddled blades. The Legion marches to war to the sound of funerary bells, every toll sending out psychic waves of dread. Thick, pungent miasmas filled with disease and rancid spores flow from ventilation systems and the billowing smokestacks of their war engines. They retch and gargle prayers to the Plague Lord as they lay down barrage after barrage of disease-riddled bullets, and they literally melt their enemies under the contagious cocktails of their chemical throwers. Fetid and rancid sorcerers breathe deep lungfuls of diseased air from the Garden of Nurgle itself, exhaling a foul plague wind. Clouds of toxic spores and a miasma of decay billow forth, corrupting all caught in its snare. Any who take a single breath of this plague cloud have their lungs rot and their innards rupture, their bodies becoming host to all forms of demonic insects that will rapidly grow to maturity before bursting forth from their victims in a horrifying swarm, eager to go forth and spread further disease through the enemy's defenses. Cults of diseased and leprous human masses follow them into battle, weeping tears of pus through scab-covered eyes, desperate to witness the Plague Lord's angels in hopes that they too shall be blessed as their lords. While those of them who have already gained such blessings drone ahead of the Plague Marines, swarms of Plague Zombies and Poxwalkers shuffle across the battlefield, a disease-induced rictus grin spread wide across their face. They absorb incoming fire and descend upon the enemies of the Death Guard in a shambling horde of diseased flesh, their gifts infecting their victims, causing them to rise once more and turn against their allies. The Death Guard's victory is much like the slow, creeping hands of death itself. It is inevitable and assured. For even if by some miracle you're able to hold them off, the malady of diseases and poxes that follow them will soon spread and completely overwhelm your planet. The battlefield becoming ground zero for a menagerie of plagues and pandemics. Their enemy's victory is always short-lived. It may take weeks or sometimes months, but eventually, the first victims will begin to vomit up clouds of flies. And within a matter of days, the demonic sickness will spread to every corner of that world. Governments and nations will begin to collapse, and the planet descends into a plague-induced anarchy. Inevitably, this world will grow into a fetid, rotting paradise. And those that try to flee from here will in turn spread the Grandfather's work to any of the worlds they seek refuge in. The Death Guard represent the death of hope, that there is no point in struggling against their inevitable victory. You'll either die or join them in blasphemous and disgusting unity. So I think it goes without saying that the Death Guard are pretty horrifying. I mean, I honestly can't really imagine a more terrifying opponent. But other than just being gross, how exactly do they fight? What types of tactics do they use, and what about their weapons? So the Death Guard are an army that normally favors tactics utilizing massive waves of infantry. And it's not that they don't use tanks or other war engines, as they definitely do, but their style of combat has always revolved around infantry-based wars of attrition. Tanks and artillery like that of the Plague Burst Crawler, or demon engines such as Defilers and Forge Fiends are definitely used by the Death Guard, but they're normally seen as more of a supporting unit. The Sons of Mortarion have always been somewhat stubborn, and choose to rely solely on their resilience and unwavering fortitude. And this was the case even before their disgusting transformation. Now every Astartes member of the Death Guard is what is known as a Plague Marine, but not all Plague Marines are part of the Death Guard. 
there are definitely Plague Marines that have fought for different legions. As Chaos Space Marines are inherently pretty selfish and kind of ununited, so sometimes they switch back and forth, choosing to join with whoever's ideology or goals fit them better. Now this definitely isn't the norm as the majority of Plague Marines fight for the Death Guard, but it does happen, so I figured it was worth mentioning. Now a Plague Marine is a Space Marine that has been overwhelmingly blessed by Nurgle. And Nurgle sees all of his poxes and diseases and mutations as gifts. Blessings that, albeit terrifying, grant them their undying and rotting forms. Now in addition to these demonic blessings, they wear mostly Mark III variants of power armor. And oddly enough, before the Horus Heresy, they had access to the newer versions, but still preferred the Mark III for its heavier armor and more durability. Now, I'll forgive you for thinking that all of the Space Marine power armor is the same with just a different helmet, but honestly, this couldn't be further from the truth. Every version had a different use, and the Mark III had a lot of armor, and was ideal for Space Marines that were fighting in environments where cover was minimal. So legions that specialized in frontal assaults tend to utilize this variant more, and the Death Guard definitely fit this bill. That being said, the armor that the Plague Marines wear is kind of a shell of what it once was. Thousands of years of battle and decay have seen the once revered armor become rusted and pockmarked. However, all of those disgusting mutations that Nurgle has granted them kind of make up for the ancient armor's shortcomings. Blood and filth has accumulated so heavily on it that it is said that some Plague Marines have layers of filth several inches deep. Now, even before their rebellion, the Death Guard rarely ever actually cleaned or polished their armor. They saw the battle damage and the blood and filth of a hundred different battlefields across a hundred different worlds as a badge of honor to be displayed with pride. So the Death Guard have undergone a couple of different iterations. When they were first formed, they were known as the Dusk Raiders. This was due for their propensity for attacking at night. Now it was said that fighting them was such a horrifying experience that many worlds would completely surrender just before the sun went down rather than have to face the Dusk Raiders in combat. However, when their Primarch Mortarion was found on the world of Barbarus and subsequently reunited with the Legion, he brought with him new styles of war derived from his experience fighting against the alien overlords of his homeworld. And the overlords were basically like gigantic alien necromancers that preyed upon humanity like cattle, but we'll get into them a little later. The human soldiers that Mortarion led on Barbarus had to get used to fighting on pretty much every form of terrain, but in particular mountainous environments. Due to the world's feudalistic nature, they utilized infantry primarily, rather than focusing on tanks and heavy artillery. And cavalry really wasn't much use fighting in the mountains. Barbarus was a pre-feudalistic world, so the humans living there really didn't have access to any kind of great technology. The vehicles that they did have access to were steam-powered at best, and thus the men of Barbarus had to get used to fighting on their feet with whatever weapons they could hold. Mortarion referred to his soldiers as the Death Guard, and when he eventually joined the Dusk Raiders, he would have the Legion renamed to that in order to honor the men of Barbarus. Mortarion and the Death Guard believe that victory is not achieved through trickery or treachery, but instead from a relentless determination and painful stubbornness. There was no hell that the Death Guard would not march through to get to their enemy. They never stopped, never fell back, and would relentlessly hold their ground no matter what the enemy threw at them. The Space Marines of the Death Guard had weapons and tactics that may not have been flashy or fancy, but much more importantly, they could be relied upon to serve their purpose without fail. Why utilize stealth or some kind of fancy tricks to beat your enemy when you can simply overwhelm them through sheer force of will and determination? The Death Guard were relentlessness incarnate, a slow march of soldiers that never faltered and never stopped, all while laying down massive salvos of bolter rounds. No matter how well entrenched the enemy was, there was no stopping the Death Guard if they were between them and their objective. However, much later in the Legion's future, when they were corrupted by Nurgle and turned into Plague Marines, their tactics changed once again, but admittedly not by much. They became way more fixated on closer range engagements, utilizing more melee weapons and various plague weapons like the Plague Belcher or even the horrific Plague Grenades, also commonly referred to as Death Heads, and for a very good reason. You see, these Plague Grenades were truly disgusting. It's not so much a grenade, rather a severed head of one of the Death Guard's enemies that has been hollowed out and filled with every contagion imaginable. Now these heads were then sealed with wax and allowed to fester for months, or sometimes years or even decades. When thrown, the plague grenade ruptures, releasing a massive wave of spores and poisonous gases that spread over a pretty large area. Those not in thick armor with a sealed ventilation system will become affected almost immediately and face a horrifying death as their insides convulse and rot away. 
even heavily armored foes really don't fare much better against these things, as the plague released from the grenade's core has the ability to rust and eat away armor in minutes. The plague weapons of the Death Guard are pretty messed up and definitely terrifying in their own right, but oddly enough, this isn't something that's new to them as even before they betrayed the Emperor, the Death Guard were known for utilizing certain types of weapons that most would consider to be a war crime. Radiation shells, virus bombings, and even the dreaded Phosphex weaponry. And those were flame-based weapons that projected a highly corrosive toxic incinerary compound that could eat through heavy armor and burn a target to ash incredibly quickly. It was said that nothing could extinguish its flames except for the cold vacuum of space and these things would leave long-lasting effects on the environment that they were used in, even more than radiation weapons. And don't get me wrong, they were definitely utilized by other legions as well, but the Imperium always kind of looked at them as a last resort kind of thing. And fun fact, they were so horrifying that a rogue tech priest actually destroyed the only known STC for them. Despite the horrifying reality of the 40k universe, this tech priest decided that they couldn't be allowed to continue to exist, as they were that inhumane. Now, a few of these ancient Phosphex weapons still exist, but the Mechanicum has never really been able to recreate them. And side note, that tech priest was declared a heretic for his actions and executed using the very same weapons. The Death Guard had no problem utilizing such terrible weaponry and saw it as necessary to protect humanity. And again, it's not like other legions didn't utilize virus bombs or Phosphex weapons, but it required careful consideration. Using such terrible weaponry would forever stain their honor, and not to mention the world upon which they were used. These worlds were supposed to be being conquered and folded into the Imperium, not just destroyed. So using weapons that would completely destroy their environment for thousands of years was not something that should be done lightly. However, the Death Guard couldn't really have cared less. Like themselves, they were tools of war and should be utilized to their fullest extent. With such a background, it should come as no surprise that in the 41st millennium, the Death Guard have become the undisputed masters of biochemical warfare, combining their long history of virus and radiation weapons with the pestilent blessings of Nurgle to concoct ever more inventive diseases and poxes to unleash on their enemies. Not only are these alchemical horrors incredibly potent and effective in their own right, but when they're infused even further with Nurgle's essence, they create a voracious and predatory demonic pathogen, more horrifying than anything we've ever seen in the modern world. It's almost like these diseases have a form of demonic sentience, a hunger to infect and spread misery and despair as far as possible. Just like the Blight Grenades, most plague weapons have a pretty limited range. And it's kind of obvious to see where they get their names from, as each one utilizes various toxins and diseases and other forms of chemical warfare to obliterate their enemies. Despite their almost universal short to mid-range profiles, the plague weapons do come in a lot of different forms, such as the plague belchers and plague spewers, flamethrowers that project trails of concentrated disease, filth, and the larvae of demonic parasites. Their chemical concoction literally causing anyone or anything hit by it to dissolve into a pile of corrosive, pestilent slop. They come in the form of grenade throwers like that of the Blight Launcher, and very rarely even in a much longer range version like the Mortars of the Plague Burst Crawlers. However, the Death Guard also utilize a lot of melee-based plague weapons, such as the Plague Knife, a rusted and pitted blade dripping with virulent toxins and diseases. Now, they may not be the sharpest blades in the galaxy, but they don't need to run an enemy through or cut them in half. A single cut from such a weapon can fell even the mightiest of beasts as the blessings of Nurgle quickly spread through the victim's body. So where do all these plague marines come from? Well, the vast majority of the Death Guard soldiers are born of Barbarous, taken from the poisonous homeworld of Mortarion. However, nowadays this is true of the majority, but not of all, as Barbarous was destroyed by the Dark Angels after the Horus Heresy. Now, many of the original Astartes from the time of the Grand Crusade still fight under the banner of the Death Guard, even now, thousands of years later. However, losses are inevitable, and new recruits will have to be made in order to replenish the lost Space Marines. Now, many of these Plague Marines start off as kidnapped infants, stolen by the Death Guard in many of their raids on feral worlds. In this way, they have no connection to their old life, and the Death Guard will inevitably be all that this child will ever know. Additionally, many Death Guard soldiers are turncoats and renegades from other chapters, who for whatever reason have turned traitor and sought out the Death Guard specifically. Now, these individuals are already Space Marines when they join, but even coming from a different legion with different gene seed, over time, they assimilate into the Death Guard nearly perfectly. They adopt Mortarion's tactics and embrace their new life of despair. Over time, the overwhelming corruption and guidance of Nurgle 
twists and turns their bodies and minds to be more like that of their plague brothers. Their insides begin to rot as the corruption seeps into every corner of their body. Their minds slow down and their armor grows heavier. Their organs begin to fuse and mutate, and their skin begins to merge with that of the multiple tubes and interfaces found throughout their armor. Eventually, this armor becomes an extension of their own body, a second metal skin, and they even lose the ability to remove their helmets as it basically becomes their new face. As the corruption spreads and intensifies, vicious demonic mutations can sprout up all over their body. Their arms can fuse into tentacles. Gaping maws may begin to sprout all over their body and all manner of other horrific corruption can take place. So is the varied and unpredictable nature of the grandfather's blessings. The change is slow, but it is inevitable. It is said that joining the Death Guard is like sinking into a deep, cold ocean. The substance of it seeps inside sooner or later, down to every crack and orifice, and you lose the things that once made you what you were. And there's actually a pretty funny scene in the Lords of Silence novel, where one of these new recruits is reflecting on their life after joining the Death Guard. He has not become nearly as mutated as his brothers, and he can still remove his helmet. But he can feel the change coming on. His emotions are mellowing out, he doesn't feel hatred anymore, and he's even beginning to lose his memories of life before the Death Guard. He can't remember what loyalist chapter he was a part of or any of the battles he took part in. And in a moment of clarity, he's looking around at his new brothers that have been with the Legion since the beginning and are far more mutated than him. One of them vomits flies with every word that he speaks. Another has tentacles for hands and a butthole for a mouth. And he's just kind of like, yeah, I definitely should have picked a different Legion. So now you understand a bit more about the Plague Marines, but I feel it's important that we talk about their father the Primarch of the Death Guard himself, Mortarion. So Mortarion is the champion of Nurgle and the demonic Primarch of the Death Guard. He is an avatar of pestilence and disease and the embodiment of fear and despair. Like the other traitor Primarchs, he has been infused with the corrupting influence of chaos, his tremendous strength and endurance having catapulted even past the demigod levels of a Primarch through the multitude of gifts and blessings he has received from the Grandfather. Mortarion strides forth onto the battlefield, held aloft by massive fetid moth wings. Everywhere Mortarion treads, he is followed by swarms of demonic insects and billowing clouds of disease. It is said that a mortal man would succumb to disease and rot and suffer the most horrifying of death just by standing in the Primarch's presence for but a moment. In battle, he wields two signature weapons, his massive scythe known as Silence and an energy pistol of mysterious origin known only as the Lantern. Now, interestingly enough, despite the fact that he has ascended into demonhood, Mortarion always had a passionate hatred of psychers and anyone who would manipulate the warp. Yet, in a spectacular twist of fate, the Death Lord himself has become a psyker, wielding potent plague magics with which to decimate his foes. And the irony is certainly not lost on him, as there's a part of him that despises what he has become. Even as a man, Mortarion was an imposing figure taller than anyone around him and bristling with corded muscle. But in demonhood, he has swelled to monstrous proportions, standing well over 30 feet tall. His mind is noted as being incredibly gifted, as he's a master tactician and has spent thousands of years studying every form of warfare. That being said, in the most recent lore, it seems like he's going a little bit insane. The ascension into demonhood has taken its toll on his mind. Now, most that manage to become a demon prince eventually go insane becoming little more than a slavering beast. Now, depending on the individual, the amount of time this takes to occur can vary. For a standard human that the gods have decided to make into a demon prince, this could take hundreds if not thousands of years. But Mortarion was a Primarch. They were demigods in their own right, so for all intents and purposes, Mortarion is handling the transformation quite well. However, it is stated that the reality of the physical universe is something that he only dimly perceives. At the same time that Mortarion is seeing reality, he's also seeing glimpses of the past and the future, and many different potential realities as well. So in this context, Mortarion has the ability to see the future, but I don't think he really has control over it. It's more of a form of demonic dementia that he's suffering from, which is causing him to lose his grip on the present. In the novel The Lords of Silence, there's a plague marine named Vorx, who at one point is in mid-conversation with Mortarion. And Mortarion starts referencing the fact that he did not foresee the universe splitting in half, that it is something that he had not anticipated. Vorx is confused by this because at the time this novel takes place, Cadia has yet to fall, and the Cicatrix Meledictum hasn't formed. Hell, I don't even believe the 13th Black Crusade has even started. 
So Mortarian is just rambling about all these events that don't make any sense, when in a moment of clarity, it seems like he's noticing Vorx for the first time, and he says to him, Ah, my mistake. That hasn't yet happened for you yet. And he informs him that the current War Master of Chaos, Abaddon the Despoiler, will be contacting him soon. Now, this perceived insanity has led many of the Death Guard to question Mortarion's ability to lead, particularly Typhus the Traveler, as him and Mortarion don't get along at all. So where did Mortarion come from, and what was he like before his demonic transformation? Now before we get into Mortarion's life on Barbarus, I think I need to give a very quick and abridged version of the creation of the Primarchs and what happened to them. So the Emperor created 20 sons, using his vast knowledge of gene engineering. They were all immensely powerful and immortal warriors. All of them had different personalities and abilities, but in some aspects, you can think of each one of them as representing a different aspect of the Emperor himself. However, when they were still in incubation tubes, a great tragedy struck, and the 20 Primarchs were whisked away and scattered across the universe, each one landing on a different world. Now, for the longest time, it was assumed that the Chaos Gods had scattered the Primarchs after the Emperor reneged on some form of deal he had struck with them. Recently, though, in the novel Saturnine, the female Perpetual named Erda claims that she had a major role to play in this, that the Emperor would not have created functioning children without a female donor. So in this aspect, Erda is claiming that she is the mother of the Primarchs. When she inevitably learned what the Emperor's plans were for them, she was horrified, as she saw them as her children, and she couldn't allow him to follow through with what he intended to do. So Erda was the one that scattered them. From her perspective, she had no choice. For the sake of her children, she had to set her sons free. Now, whether Erda is telling the truth, or whether she was being manipulated by chaos, we don't really know. And in 40k, characters be lying all the time. So I wouldn't take this as the exact truth, as I don't think it's 100% confirmed. But admittedly, her story does seem pretty plausible. And as far as I can tell, she really doesn't have a reason to be lying about this. Unlike the story we heard a few years ago when the Silent King came out, where an Eldar emissary basically said that him and the Necrons were the ones that created the Tyranids. You can never trust what an Eldar is telling you, so I don't believe a word of that. Regardless of how the scattering happened, Mortarion was one of these Primarchs and he had the misfortune of landing on a death world known as Barbarous, having to deal with such horrible living conditions, rampant monster attacks, and the ever-present threat of the overlords, meant that humanity here was never really able to prosper. The humans of Barbarous lived in a pre-feudalistic society, one where advancement really wasn't an option when you were struggling for survival on a day-to-day -day basis. The most powerful of the overlords was named Akari, and one day, he was standing in the middle of a massive battlefield, surrounded by the corpses of humans that had dared stand against him. His evil and triumphant laughter, however, was interrupted by, of all things, the cries of an infant. Now this didn't make any sense to Nakari, as the air surrounding the battlefield was incredibly poisonous, and no human should be able to breathe it without a respirator system. Yet here in the middle of it all were the sounds of a crying child. Now he searched for days and strode through thousands of corpses until eventually the baby boy was found. For a moment, the overlord considered killing him and being done with it. However, he was deeply fascinated by this creature and realized he was much more than any normal human. So the overlord scooped him up in his arms and carried him away from the scene of death. For all the things the overlord had and everything at his disposal, the one thing that he lacked was a son and more importantly, an heir. He was born of death in a field of death. So the Overlord christened him Mortarion, the child of death. Now, as Mortarion grew, he proved to have an intellect and an obsession for knowledge like no other. He spent his days studying manuscripts of war and pretty much any book he could get his hands on. His adopted father figure built him a massive spire to live in, constructed at the absolute highest peak he determined that Mortarion could survive, making his own home miles away at the top of a mountain where the poison was its strongest. He wanted to make Mortarion's life as awful as possible without killing him. And Nakari proved to be vicious and cruel, said to be the most brutal and feared of all the overlords. He was constantly testing Mortarion, putting him in ever-increasing dangerous positions, such as throwing the boy into a pit of rabid dogs before he was even able to walk, stripping him naked and forcing him to scale the sheerest of cliffs during a torrential acid storm or even at one point making him slay a legion of necromantic golems barehanded, always in judgment and often in mockery, never satisfied with Mortarion's accomplishments. Now, Mortarion didn't really know much about the humans that lived on Barbarous, let alone the fact that they were the same species as him, as Nakari had forbid him from ever going near them. 
However, one day from the balcony of his spire, he witnessed several humans engaged in a battle with some of the Overlord's flesh puppets, golems crafted from the dissected parts of their victims, and given new life through the Overlord's necromantic abilities. He surmised that the humans must have escaped from Nakari's skin works, and that this very well may be another one of the cruel Overlord's tests for him. Whether he intervened, descended the ramparts to capture the humans, or stood by as a witness to murder, whatever choice he made, he knew by his father's standards it would be the wrong one, and he would be punished for it severely. Now, one of the members of the human party that was being attacked was a young boy, and he looked up and noticed the shadowy figure watching them from above. He screamed out for him to please help them. Mortarion didn't know what to do and was incredibly conflicted, as the only life he had ever known had been underneath the overlords. Yet these people were asking for his help. Now, after a brief internal conflict where Mortarion went over pretty much every horrible thing that Nakari had ever done to him, he leapt from the spire and slaughtered the golems, breaking the proverbial chains his father had on him, and sealing his fate with a defiant act of treason. Now, after the battle, the young boy asked Mortarion why he bothered to help them. He knew who Mortarion was and that he was a thrall of the overlords. In fact, all of the humans knew about him. This surprised Mortarion, and he looked at the boy and said, I did it because you asked me to. The boy says he doesn't understand and he's incredibly confused by that statement. And Mortarion actually smiles. He laughs. He says that you offered me a choice and no one had ever done that for me. He didn't have to intervene. He could have watched all of them die. He wasn't being given an order. And this was a profound moment for him because for the very first time, Mortarion realized that he could make his own decisions. Mortarion tells a young boy to run, as Nakari and his army were in pursuit, the sounds of his war sirens blaring in the distance and swiftly approaching their location. The boy refuses to leave him and demands that Mortarion come with him, as clearly he is human just like him. Mortarion asks him his name, and the young boy says that it's Callus, Callus Typhon. With what Mortarion had done, he had turned his back on everything he had ever been, everything that he ever knew, and began his life as his own man. Now, I think it's apparent that Mortarion saved Typhon's life this day, but I think more importantly, Typhon actually saved his. Many years would pass, and eventually Mortarion would rally the human population of Barbarus. He would train them in the art of war, distilling into them the wisdom he had gained from all of those books in his spire. He had intimate knowledge of all of the overlords as well, their strengths and their weaknesses, and one by one, he led a militia of human resistance fighters to take them down one after the other. Eventually, only Nakari was left. But before Mortarion and his men could make the assault on the Overlord's fortress, they had a very unsuspected visitor. One day, one of Mortarion's men informed him that a guest was waiting for him in the lodge and that he needed to speak with him. The stranger had traveled to their world in some kind of glorious spacefaring vessel, the likes of which none of the feudal population of Barbarus had ever encountered. The man informs him that the person is unlike anyone they've ever encountered before. Not only was he glorious in all aspects, but he came bringing tales of an impossible civilization beyond the clouds, that there were people like the men and women of Barbarus all over the cosmos, that they had all been united into some kind of great empire, and that the visitor wanted Barbarus to join them. But above all else, the visitor had come bearing medicine, supplies, and most importantly, food. He tells Mortarion that the visitor had even assisted them in a recent battle and that the stranger had said he would give them whatever they wanted, technology, knowledge, supplies, medicine, anything needed to retake their world if they so chose and rebuild it in their own image. You have to understand, Mortarion has lived a pretty awful life, so he's incredibly suspicious of this new person. He believes that anything that's too good to be true most certainly is. Now, as the soldier is telling him all this, Mortarion is just getting more and more pissed off with every word his mood growing darker and darker until eventually he's had enough and storms off to find the stranger. The men are kind of confused by this, as the stranger seems awesome. But Typhon explains to the other soldiers that can you really blame him? Today was supposed to be the day of Barbarus's deliverance, the day they stormed Akari's fortress. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this godlike being decides to just show up at this particular moment. It kind of overshadows pretty much everything Mortarion had sacrificed and done up until this point. Mortarion opens the door to the lodge, and there, surrounded by his high-ranking Death Guard officers, was this newcomer. The man turned and looked at him, and his gaze was so overwhelming and powerful that Mortarion had to consciously fight off the compulsion to kneel. 
He was unlike any person he had ever seen, the complete opposite of the pale and gaunt men of Barbarous. He had long sable hair, bronze skin like hard leather, and deep dark eyes that were hopeful yet sorrowful. And he could see that behind those eyes was an impossibly ancient wisdom. He was tall and muscular and clad in ornate golden armor. And despite its clearly enormous weight, his movements were fluid and flexible. Despite the impossibility of it all, he was very clearly not from this world. Yet, he was also unquestionably human, just like the rest of them. The stranger tells him that he comes seeking noble souls to reunite the humans of this world with the rest of their people, that he has come offering Barbarous its deliverance, and that in joining him, Mortarion would gain glory and prosperity. Now, despite the fact that Mortarion is very clearly shaken by the newcomer's presence, he angrily states that him and his men have been under overlord rule for hundreds of years. Where were you then, he demands. The emperor looks incredibly disheartened, and he says that he regrets it taking him so long to come, but that he can tell Mortarion of his origins and what his purpose was. Mortarion claims he doesn't care about his origins anymore and that Barbarous was his home. Mortarion tells the stranger that him and his charity were not wanted and that he should go back in his metal bird and fly away. The Emperor contests this and asks him if he's sure, because from where he's standing, the main overlord was still alive, and they hadn't yet taken him out. And that statement definitely pissed Mortarion off, and he tells him that Nakari will die by his hand soon enough. The Emperor asks him if he's sure of this, so sure that he's willing to make a wager. He tells him that Mortarion right now is claiming to speak for his entire planet, and if he's willing to speak for all of Barbarous, then he must prove his resolve to him. He tells Mortarion that if he can lead his men and defeat Nakari on his own, then the Emperor will leave and the Imperium will never bother their planet again. But if he fails to kill him, then Mortarion and his Death Guard would swear loyalty to the Emperor, and all of Barbarus would join the Imperium. And strangely enough, Mortarion agrees to this challenge. In this moment, he's not thinking 100% clearly. He's definitely pretty upset. Who was this emperor, this stranger, to show up unannounced at the moment of their hard-fought victory to make any kind of demands of him? He didn't have to prove anything to this guy. He was the Reaper, the Lord of Death, and the Emancipator of Barbarous. But there was something about the way the emperor was speaking that made him want to prove himself to him. Ultimately, however, Mortarion would fail. The rebreathers he had designed for his men were not strong enough to compensate for the sheer ludicrous level of poison at the peak of the mountain that Nakari had called home. One by one, his soldiers fell to the defenses of the mountain or were forced to retreat until only Mortarion was left. Eventually, even he could go no further as the poison and the overlord's defenses left him unable to move, spasming in the mud and rain. He has a moment of realization where he understands that this is the end and that he had ultimately failed but then something happens. He hears the stranger's voice, and he opens his eyes to see the emperor standing above him. The stranger says that you will not perish this day, my son. His voice is overflowing with love and compassion, and as Mortarion's vision begins to fade, he sees the emperor striding forward into Nakari's lair. Before unconsciousness can overtake him completely, Mortarion whispers, I will always hate you. The Emperor succeeded in killing Nakari, thus ridding Barbarous of the Overlords forever, and the planet and Mortarion followed through with their word and swore loyalty to him. But even years later, Morty still held a deep hatred for the Emperor, as he had robbed him of his ultimate victory. He had stolen the vengeance that was rightfully his. The Overlords had tortured him, stolen his normal life, and they had preyed upon his people for hundreds of years. This was supposed to be the moment of their final victory, Everything that had happened had been working towards that moment. And yeah, the Emperor definitely followed through and helped make their goal a reality. And it's possible that without his assistance, Barbarous would have saw another several thousand years under the rule of the Overlords. And part of Mortarion understands this, but even still, that bitterness remained in his soul forever. So after the events of Barbarous, Mortarion would join the Imperium, and he would be reunited with his legion, the Dusk Raiders. He would have them renamed to the Death Guard in honor of the men and women that had fought by his side on Barbarous. He would then instill the wisdoms and teachings of the Death Guard into this new legion. And as more recruits were folded into their ranks, the Death Guard would recruit them almost exclusively from Barbarous. Many of the men that had fought beside Mortarion against the Overlords, including the young boy Callus himself, would become Space Marines. Mortarion and his Death Guard would fight in many battles in the Emperor's name 
and were actually one of the most successful legions when it came to reclaiming worlds during the Grand Crusade. They may not have been the most efficient legion, but they were absolutely brutal in their crushing pursuit of victory. However, Mortarion always had a deep-seated hatred of psychers, and you can't really blame him, considering that his entire planet had been enslaved by a bunch of alien necromancers. But the Emperor had created the Librarians, and one of the Death Guard Brother Legions, the Thousand Sons, was made up exclusively of psychers. He saw the Emperor as a hypocrite for utilizing such dangerous witchcraft that did nothing but bring corruption. His testimony against the Thousand Sons during the Council of Nicaea was a pretty pivotal and crucial speech that led to that Legion's censure, and thus the Emperor's subsequent disbanding of the Librarium. Now, due to their experience with the Overlords, Mortarion and the Death Guard also had a massive hatred for tyrants, particularly tyrants who used psychic powers to enslave their population. At this point in his life, it was Mortarion's ultimate goal to rid the universe of these tyrants, and it was a point of personal pride for him and his legion that their resilience and endurance could be used to protect those too weak to protect themselves. Now, this philosophy, however, would begin to become corrupted, as the Death Guard were one of the first legions to join in Horus' great betrayal, and that innate desire to protect the weak would eventually curdle into an abhorrence for those who could not defend themselves. Now, it should come as no surprise that, considering their deep hatred of the Emperor and all those that were part of the Imperium that didn't directly come from Barbarus itself, that on the world of Istanbul III, when the Traitor Legion sent down their own brothers who they didn't think would follow them in their betrayal, to subsequently virus bomb them, the vast majority of those that the Death Guard sent were not of Barbarus, they were the original Terranborn Dusk Raiders. Later on at Istvan V, the Death Guard would gather with all of the other traitor legions, with the exception of the Thousand Sons, to brutally massacre their fellow brothers, the Salamanders, the Raven Guard, and the Iron Hands, killing an absolutely enormous amount of loyalists. It was said that the Raven Guard chapter alone had its numbers drop from 80,000 to 3,000 during this tragedy. It was one of the most shocking and reprehensible acts of betrayal humanity had ever seen. And if I'm being honest, it deserves its own video series, because there's a lot to cover. Now, after a series of campaigns against the Imperium, eventually the Traitor Legions were closing in on Terra itself. And unfortunately, during a warp jump, Mortarion and the Death Guard would become stuck in the Sea of Souls, their ships becalmed, with no way out. This, however, was no freak accident. It was an act of betrayal that had been planned out by none other than Callus Typhon himself. After becoming a Space Marine, the young boy that Mortarion had saved so long ago would become his right-hand man. He would ascend the ranks and become the first captain of the Death Guard. He was his oldest friend, and there was none Mortarion trusted more. However, the nature of Typhon's origins were almost as mysterious as Mortarion himself. For you see, that boy wasn't only human, he was actually half Overlord. His entire life, he had been capable of great and terrible magic, something that in his youth other people on Barbarus were kind of terrified of. He had mastered them in secret and kept them suppressed, and after seeing Mortarion and his legion's deep hatred of psychers, he further repressed his abilities, preferring to rely on his rugged determination and unbreakable willpower like the rest of his brothers. Now, that was however until Typhon would end up accompanying the Wordbearer fleets. It was with them that he learned of a potential future where his gifts were not hated and feared, but celebrated. It was Erebus of the Wordbearers that inducted Typhon into one of their lodges which was basically a secret gathering of space marines and a practice that would soon spread throughout the traitor legions. Now, Typhon saw what the space marines could truly become under the path the word bearers were on, that psychic abilities were the way of the future, and that these ruinous powers, as the word bearers called them, were gods far more worthy of worship than the false emperor. Typhon was actually pretty instrumental in spreading thoughts of betrayal through the Death Guard, and inevitably played a pivotal role in that legion joining Horus' rebellion. But the most heinous thing that Typhon ever did, and I'll be real, it's a pretty long list of messed up stuff, was during that warp jump to Terra, as he had had all of the navigators aboard the Death Guard fleets executed, claiming that it was their fault that they had become becalmed, that they were traitors amongst traitors and were still secretly loyal to the Imperium. Now, it was at this point that Nurgle's corrupting influence began to seep into all of the ships in the Death Guard's fleet and eventually one of the Space Marines would be afflicted with a terrible illness, something unheard of for them, as their human resilience had made them all but immune to disease. Now, it was Mortarion himself that eventually gave the mercy stroke to the dying soldier. And you have to understand that he sees these men as his sons. This individual was surely of barbarous descent, and he didn't deserve to die like this, stuck in the warp, dying from illness, rather than on the battlefield like a true warrior. The most Mortarion could do for him was to end his suffering quickly. 
Moments after he plunged the knight into both of the soldiers' hearts, his body lurched forward. He stood upright and started going berserk, swinging his arms frantically, fighting and screaming. Morty backed out of the cell and sealed him inside, the creature frantically crying and smashing at the glass. Everyone in the room was completely shocked. They had no idea what was happening. The sickness then quickly began to spread throughout the fleet. Death Guard soldiers began vomiting up their insides, racked with unbelievable pain. And in one of the greatest ironies in the 41st millennium, their inhuman resilience wouldn't let them die. They were made to just suffer eternally. Even Mortarion eventually became infected. The only one of the Death Guard that wasn't suffering from this illness was Typhon himself. Now, it was revealed that this virus was known as the Destroyer Plague, and Typhon had been working with Nurgle to spread it throughout the Death Guard. He told Mortarion that this was the future, and that all he had to do to end him and his son's suffering was to pledge their souls to Nurgle. Eventually, Mortarion's defiance would break, and he agreed, pledging the loyalty of himself and his sons to the Grandfather. The entirety of the Destroyer Plague retreated into Typhon's body, swelling him with Nurgle's might. He became the host of the Destroyer Hive, a horrific weapon that took the form of a living nest of demonic insects, infected with this plague that literally lived inside his body. And he's actually able to summon out a swarm of these insects from these bone-like tubes erupting from his back at his command. Having taken his place as the Herald of Nurgle, Typhon abandoned his old name and was from that point known only as Typhus. And with that, it was done. The pain and horror Mortarion's sons were afflicted with disappeared, but their bodies remained mutated and unrecognizable. They had become the Plague Marines. They were the personification of the Legion's teachings and ideals, and they were now truly undying, a legion of immortal, nearly indestructible warriors that from this day forth would spread the blessings of the Grandfather across space and time. Now, I don't want to defend Typhus here, but we have to kind of understand his point of view. He thought he was doing what he had to, that the Death Guard were marching on the most well-defended planet in the entire Imperium, and that through subservience to Nurgle, they would become the ultimate weapon. They would reach the pinnacle of perfection like no Astartes had ever done. He knew that Mortarion and the Legion would not agree with him, and due to their deep distrust of the warp, that they couldn't be convinced to see the truth of the universe. They had to be shown what Nurgle could do, that his gifts would have to be forced on them. Unfortunately for them, the Death Guard and the rest of the Traitor Legions would ultimately be unsuccessful and were pushed back from Terra. And stubborn as always, it is said that the Death Guard were the last to abandon the siege. Like many of the other traitor legions after the Horus Heresy ended, the Death Guard fled into the Eye of Terror to escape their loyalist hunters. Mortarion and Typhus would survive these events, but their relationship was shattered beyond repair, and Typhus would eventually take off to lead his own warband. And although it's not like a Primarch to suffer discontent or rebellion in any form, he allowed Typhus to go. And the two of them still work together from time to time, although they don't see eye to eye. Typhus, by all accounts, is the perfect puppet of Nurgle that the Plague Lord wishes Mortarion would be. Morty to this day is still incredibly distrusting of the Grandfather, but he'll still utilize his blessings in war as much as he would with the ancient Phosphex weapons. The power of Nurgle is a tool, and tools are meant to be used. Now, needless to say, this leads to a lot of interesting headbutting between Mortarion and Typhus, but that's neither here nor there. Now, interestingly enough, it's not uncommon when reading 40k novels to hear Chaos Space Marines bickering and arguing with themselves, many of them going as far to speak ill of their Primarchs, disagreeing with their decisions and even laughing at them behind their back. Or even in some cases, like with Angron of the World Eaters, his legionnaires outright hating him. There is a pattern of this in the Death Guard as well. Typhus openly mocks him to his face and to anyone who will listen. They disagree on pretty much everything. His beliefs about his Primarch have spread not only to his own warband, but to many others as well. However, with the Death Guard, distrust and malcontent for their Primarch is not as widespread as it is with other Traitor Legions. And this is something really important about the Death Guard that you need to understand. The majority of them are natives of Barbarus. The men that fought by his side during the reign of the Overlords still remember just how horrifying it was. And the originators of the Legion will always remember that Mortarion's first act of liberty was to save them. He rescued them from a mockery of existence, from a planet-sized prison where they were nothing more than animals to be fed upon. And despite the sneers from Typhus and other warlords, the true sons of Barbarus will never forget what Mortarion did, and they will always be in his service, no matter what flaws he may have. And when it comes to Callus Typhon himself, regardless of the fact that the Death Guard's emotions have been kind of muted by the blessings of Nurgle, and they no longer really feel hatred, they still remember what he did, and they will never forget. There was a long period of time where Mortarion had not been seen outside of the Eye of Terror for thousands of years. 
However, he recently returned and led the Death Guard on a campaign through the realm of Ultramar in an event known as the Plague Wars. He was inevitably pushed back, but not before spreading an enormous amount of plague and disease through many of Ultramar's worlds. And the campaign concluded with a climactic battle between himself and his brother Gilliman. Now, from the Death Guard's point of view, the corruption and destruction of Ultramar were certainly a major goal, but it wasn't their primary objective. You see, an alliance was struck between Mortarion and a great unclean one known as Kugoth. It was the plague demon's job to brew a disease strong enough to kill a god, and it was subsequently known as the God Blight. Though despite many setbacks, he was ultimately successful in creating this disease. Mortarion took the God Blight, and during a battle with Gilliman, managed to infect him with it. And Gilliman surely would have died if it hadn't been for the divine psychic intervention of the God Emperor himself, albeit in psychic form through a vision that Gilliman was having in a near-death fugue state. The trilogy is pretty entertaining and gives a lot of deeper insights into Mortarion, Typhus, and the Death Guard as a whole my favorite of which being at some point, Mortarion actually managed to pluck his overlord father's soul from the warp and now keeps it in a jar on his ship so he can torture it whenever he likes. Now this doesn't quite nullify his anger over not being able to kill him himself, but it definitely brings him some form of joy, if he's even capable of feeling that now. I guess even the Primarchs need a hobby. Now I personally think Mortarion is a lot more complicated than people tend to give him credit for as there's nothing really straightforward about him or the hatred that he feels and how he even really interprets that hatred. He doesn't have the saint-like calm of his brother Lorgar nor the frothing single-minded rage of his brother Angron. And it is said that he carried a much heavier burden with him through the ages since the time of his upbringing. It is said that for Mortarion, everything came for him late and with great difficulty. He was the last to be corrupted by chaos, the last to arrive on Terra and the last to flee from the Imperial Palace. Just beneath the surface, there's a simmering rage that Mortarion feels. For the Emperor, his overlord father, for his brothers, for the Imperium, and in some respects, even his own legion. Mortarion was deeply damaged by his past, and even if the course of history had changed and went in a completely different direction, his psyche would always have ended up in a fractious state. This is something that one of the Plague Marines and the Lords of Silence is ruminating on right before he meets his Primarch. He understands who and what Mortarion is, flaws and all, but he states that even if Mortarion is damaged, that this is something to be celebrated. For you see, what the Death Guard understand that their Imperial counterparts have yet to grasp is that trying to fend off corruption is nothing but a source of great disappointment. It's impossible to keep out, and although very difficult to do so, learning to embrace it is incredibly profound. Otherwise, you're signing yourself up for a long and grueling, and most importantly, inevitable defeat. And if there's one last fact about Mortarion that I can leave you with that I think is incredibly important for you to understand who and what he is, is that he actually wasn't bald. I know, shocking, as a lot of the artwork tends to picture him bald, just like half of his traitor brothers, but this wasn't the case for him. Book 52 of the Horus Heresy, The Buried Dagger, describes him with long black hair, amber eyes, and pale skin. Pretty much all of the official artwork of him depicts him with his signature cowl, so we don't really get to see that beautiful mane of nasty, filthy hair. But I figured this was worth pointing out. To me, I feel like he's got kind of a Nathan Explosion vibe going on. All right, moving on from Mortarion, let's talk about the terrible place that the Death Guard now call home. So the Death Guard's original homeworld of Barbarus was actually destroyed by the Dark Angels after the Horus Heresy, as it had become a breeding ground for corruption. However, in the Eye of Terror, Mortarion created a new world referred to only as the Plague Planet. This was a world that was once known as Eliathada, but no one has called it that in a very long time. It's an ancient Eldar word that means sublime soul garden, but it can also be translated as meaning prideful wasteland or the dry valley of dreams. As the Eldar language is quite complicated and words have multiple interpretations, yet somehow all of them are kind of fitting for this place. You see, Mortarion shaped this planet to his will, and he fashioned it in the image of Old Barbarus, something that Typhus was kind of sickened by as he felt that such a world only had sentimental purposes and was a massive waste of time and resources when the Death Guard could be out spreading the Grandfather's blessings throughout the galaxy. From orbit, the beautiful appearance of the planet hides its sinister nature. It's an incredible emerald green sphere whose aura is said to radiate every color known to man plus some that can't even really be described and their names are only known to demons. The color is derived from a thick layer of poisonous clouds that are several miles deep and cover the entirety of the world. Mortarion designed these plague clouds as he wished to keep the surface of the planet hidden from prying eyes. 
and the clouds themselves are made of corrosive contagions that would cause any ship that tried to penetrate them to corrode and fall apart in minutes. Only the ships of the Death Guard are able to pass through intact. The planet is a plague-riddled hellscape. Massive black spires stand erect over the entire surface of the world. Unnatural mountain ranges of black rock and dark iron, slick with slime and rot. There are so many of them that it is said that viewing the landscape from above resembles a giant black porcupine. Now, in between these spires live hordes of plague-ridden barbarians that cling to their miserable existence among the entropic forests and fetid swamps. Massive diseased beasts roam amongst the trees and through the planet's disgusting valleys, preying on the humans and mutants that call this place home. Atop the fetid spires, the Death Guard have built countless bastions and fortresses, ironically making them resemble the overlords of ancient Barbarus, which is an irony that is definitely not lost on them. Each of the Death Guard's great plague companies maintain a colossal fortress here, the largest of which being known as the Black Mance, or the Whispering Tower, which is Mortarion's personal bastion. It's said that the Black Mance is a twisted parody of the Imperial Palace, everything being bleak, dark, and twisted, and not to mention every aspect from the gates to the walls to the towers are precisely seven centimeters taller. Mortarion was pretty petty like that. The Plague Planet is covered in disease factories, laboratories, and all manner of rusted forge where every day, numerous demon engines are crafted, as well as thousands of new plagues and poxes. This is a world completely consumed by disease, where thousands die every day down in the muck. And deep within the disease factories of the Plague Planet, the foul blight spawn of the Death Guard oversee the construction and design of ever more terrifying poxes. These rotting laboratories are filled with overflowing vats of contagious liquid, and hundreds if not thousands of captured slaves that are used as test subjects. These terrible places are overwhelming with the blessings of Nurgle. And the Blightspawn that are in charge of crafting these maladies also take them into themselves, as it would be unfair only to allow the test subjects to be so blessed. In the short run, this makes them stronger and gives them an enormous amount of insight into the nature of disease. But over time, the corrupting influence of these plagues mutate their bodies, and they'll eventually reach a breaking point. It is said that in these laboratories, Master Blightspawn can be seen stuck to the walls, having taken root within the factory itself, like a sentient fungus. It is here that the new Foul Blightspawn come to seek wisdom from their predecessors, before returning to their warbands with their new creations, ready to be unleashed upon an unsuspecting universe. And a fun little side note about this world, it's said that the Death Guard control one of the largest fleets within the Traitor Legions, and this is because when they're forced to leave a ship behind or it's destroyed, the Drifting Hulks somehow always find their way back to the Plague Planet. Whether by Nurgle's will or their own twisted machine spirits, they always make it back to their heretical overlords, eager to serve and act as a blasphemous vessel for which the Death Guard can spread their horrors. And the Death Guard see the Plague Planet as beautiful. It is a vindication of their esoteric creed, the belief that through entropy comes apotheosis, of the wholehearted embrace of mortality in all of its truest and most honest aspects. The Legion will only rest when all worlds are Plague Planets, and the bells toll out across a galaxy made into the image of spectacular decay. So in closing, I can think of no better emotion to describe the Death Guard than that of irony. Mortarion had a deep-seated hatred of Psykers and the Warp, and yet now he is a mutated plague demon and a Psyker in his own right, ruling over a planet within the Eye of Terror. The Death Guard began their long journey as men seeking to overthrow their demigod-like overlords, only to now find themselves in a very similar position, ruling from amongst black spires. They spent their history building up their immunity and resilience only to be infected with a plague of horrible proportions. But due to this training, could not die from it. Typhus kept his powers hidden because the Legion feared them, only to use those very same powers against them in the most horrific way imaginable. The story of the Death Guard is undoubtedly tragic. The proud and noble Legion that once existed has been replaced with plague-ridden monsters, a vector of disease and death through which the Grandfather spreads his blessings across the cosmos. So much of who they were has been lost. Their honor, their chivalry, their desire to rid the universe of tyrants, it's all been replaced with the blasphemous need to spread corruption and death. And to me, the most tragic thing of all is that Mortarion, the breaker of chains and the emancipator of Barbarus, the noble Primarch who sought to rid the universe of tyrants and use his son's strength to protect the weak, has become a mockery of his former self, a twisted parody, a ghoulish plague-ridden wraith he had always been referred to as the Reaper, but now that title fits better than ever. 
as this once noble hero of mankind, who united a world to overthrow their oppressors, has become a tyrant more vicious and cruel than all of the overlords combined. He is now the aspect of death itself. Him and the Death Guard are an infection upon the galaxy, one that if left unchecked will continue to spread, until there is nothing but decay and entropy. And if the Imperium refuses to see the truth that the Death Guard offer, then they will let the galaxy rot. And I'll leave you with a passage from the Lords of Silence that I think is pretty enlightening. You see, there's a scene where a captured guardsman has been forced to live aboard one of the Death Guard ships, and he ends up in a pretty interesting conversation with one of their tallymen. This guardsman is beginning to be corrupted by Nurgle against his will, and his body is going through some pretty awful changes. But at this moment, he still has his sanity and is ultimately loyal to the Imperium. He asked the tallyman if there was a path to redemption. Would the Death Guard take it? Would they come back to the Imperium? And the tallyman tells him, there are no ways back. That is the only unchangeable fact of the universe. Even the gods do not break that law. Tread the path to its end or tread no path at all. There are no resting places and there are no ways back. The guardsman tells him that they'll kill you. The Emperor's angels, they'll kill all of you. And the tallyman tells him that they might. But as you've begun to discover for yourself, there are far worse things than an honest death. <laughs>